Hello everyone, my name is Teddy Nenno, I'm the host of the Philosophical Trials podcast. If you're ever puzzled by quantum computing, I'm excited to announce that today we are joined by a world-leading figure in the area of quantum computing and computational complexity theory. He is Scott Aronson, professor of computer science at the University of Texas at Austin and one of the greatest communicators of computer science that is well known for his extremely engaging way of explaining difficult theoretical ideas. So if you ever scratched your head around the notions of uh, quantum computational uh, supremacy or the P equals MP problem, I think you've come to the right place. So let's dive in. Hi, Hi. Professor Aronson. Thanks for being here. That, yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm actually very excited to this conversation because, as I told you in the in the invitation email, uh, I studied computer science and philosophy at Oxford, and your work was was very famous uh, around people that studied this combination. I mean, you wrote a book called Quantum Computing Since uh, Since Democritus, uh, where you touch on a lot of philosophically related topics. So, what draws you to philosophy? I mean, you're a computer scientist, but you talk about philosophy a lot. Well, I mean, I mean, for me, the question is almost, you know, what draws people to anything other than philosophy, right? I mean, philosophy, uh, almost by definition, is about the biggest questions that you could possibly ask, right? Uh, you know, why is there a universe at all, right? You know, what can we be absolutely certain of? You know, is the universe a computer simulation? You know, what, what, what do you even mean in asking a question like that? You know, how would we find out, right? You know, and, and um, um, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, if you if you're curious about how the universe fits together, then of course you're going to gravitate toward sort of what what seem like the biggest questions that you could possibly ask. Right now, you know, I think that you know, and 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 you see that that the the you know in 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 the history of human inquiry, right? Philosophy came very very early, right? Uh, you know, with uh, and and what we now call science, you know, used to be just natural philosophy. Right, it used to be just one branch of philosophy. Uh, now, now I think that there actually is a good answer to the question of why be interested in things other than philosophy. And um, you know, uh, besides just okay, we have practical needs. You know, we need to figure out how to grow food and how to you know stop the coronavirus. And you know, uh, we have uh, various practical problems. But in addition to that, even if you only care about you know understanding the world. Well, you know, it turns out that that um, you know there are there are in 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 science and in math there are tools for making actual progress on things, right? If you spend, you know, if if you only study philosophy, then there's a danger of going around in circles, you know, uh, uh, um, trying to explicate the you know the meanings of of, of words and uh, uh, um, you know sort of never never uh, uh, grasping on to anything. Uh, firm that you can, you know, that you can climb up on, right? In, in science and in math, uh, sometimes you might, you know, or, or often you might be addressing much smaller questions, uh, you know, just very particular questions, but the advantage is that you can actually make progress on those questions, right? And we, we know exactly what progress looks like, you know, we know how to recognize it when we see it, um, you know, uh, it can be much more clear cut. And then, you know, if you look over the broad sweep of history, you know, I think it's undeniable that advances in science and in math um, have totally transformed the way we talk about even the biggest philosophical questions, right? So whether we're talking about, you know, Gödel's theorem, the theory of computability, uh, about Darwinian evolution, about uh, uh, relativity, about quantum mechanics. Right. These were all discoveries that started in science and that really, you know, transformed, uh, I, I would say, the way that even we, we talk about philosophical questions. And so, you know, for, for me, that that's kind of the sweet spot, right? I mean, that that's the gold standard to, to really um, uh, aim for, right? To do, to do uh, a science that actually, you know, addresses these gigantic philosophical questions. But the huge philosophical questions in some sense, you know, those are the things that I care about first. And can you give me an example where it uh, it was wise in the course of history to abandon one of the huge philosophical questions and focus on one smaller sub-question and this really changed the discussion around the larger question? Uh, well, sure. I mean, I mean, there were very famous examples. Like, I mean, people for... Um, uh, um, 
thousands of years in some sense, you know, uh, talked about the question of, you know, what, what is thinking, uh, uh, you know, could, a, uh, could an automaton think, you know, could a machine think, right? You know, and that becomes very explicit with um, uh, Leibniz, uh, with, um, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, I guess a, 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 a lady loveless, you know, uh, uh, people writing about it in the, in the 19th century, people, uh, 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 and then um, in 1950, you know, Alan Turing wrote his paper, uh, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, where he said, you know, that question is, you know, uh, uh, you know, we, you know, we, 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 uh, uh, we don't even understand what it means or what would count as an answer to it. So let's substitute it for a different question. Let's substitute it for the question, could we build a machine that, you know, you couldn't tell the difference between it and a person? you were talking to it, right? And, uh, um, you know, that was, um, you know, I think a, a revolutionary idea, right? You can, you can argue about whether the replacement question is, you know, really a good substitute for the original question, but at the very least, it seems relevant to the original question, right? It seems like, you know, if there were a machine, you know, there is not now a machine that behaves indistinguishably from a person or, you know, a computer, I mean, or a digital, a programmable digital computer that does. But if there were, it seems clear that that would change the whole discussion. And you know, this is an empirical question. This is something that we can make progress on. You know, and Turing, you know, already foresaw that you know uh, people were going to make progress on it, right? And today, you know, uh, 70 years afterwards, right? Just a few months ago, uh, 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 there was this, uh, or maybe only one month ago, there was this engine uh, release. GPT-3, have you seen it? No, I haven't. It's, uh, seen it's, a, it's an engine for like, you, you write some text and it completes it. And you know, I would, you know, and, and it, 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 it's, a, it's a, basically, it, it's a deep neural network that was trained on the entire internet. You know, it comes from a, a, a group at OpenAI. I would say that it is pretty close to passing some, you know, a Turing test against, let's say, a, a, an ordinary judge, one who, one who is not, you know, the one who isn't trained at, you know, so, someone who's trained at how to tell it apart from a human would be able to do that. Someone who is not trained, you know, it is, um, you know, it is, it is clearly progress toward passing the Turing test. Are you okay? personally and, you know, set? Which, which, which just underscores, I mean, even without that example, you know, we know, you know, this, this is clearly the kind of question that one can make progress on, right? And so, um, so that, so that, so that would be one example. Another example would be, uh, you know, questions about, um, you know, uh, uh, the nature of space and time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Kant, uh, 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 you know, wrote uh, these uh, long books about how, you know, uh, 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 you know, the nature of space and the nature of time, or you know, was like a one one big example of something that is, you know, a priori knowledge, right? That's not mathematical tautologies, but we clearly, you know, know it a priori. Okay, now, you know, now we know that Kant's view was wrong. How do we know that it's wrong? Well, because of Einstein, okay? Because, I mean, you know, you can realize philosophically that, that, that you know, you can counter argue against Kant, you know, on philosophical grounds, but now we're absolutely certain that he was wrong because we are, you know, we have our best theory of space and time, you know, is, is no longer the intuitively obvious one, okay? And um, so, so that, so that, you know, and, and, and so, you know, by asking, uh, um, you know, uh, um, questions about, you know, uh, uh, how do we know if two events are simultaneous? You know, how do we even define a concept like length or like uh, 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 duration? You know, and then, um, so, you know, what, what does physics actually say about these concepts after we've defined them? You know, we turn these into questions that we can make actual progress on. I agree with you on the Kantian example and Einstein's theory of relativity, but are you personally satisfied with the Turing test, even if passed as a satisfactory test for intelligence and thinking? Not necessarily, no. I mean, um, you know, as, as I said, uh, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, I don't think that it's clear that, uh, uh, well, you know, you know, you know, you can argue about is passing the Turing test a necessary condition for intelligence. You can argue about is it a sufficient condition? I don't think either of those, you know, is is is. is I mean, I mean, you know, one one could say, all right, well, well, certainly it shouldn't be a necessary condition because 
you know, there must be many ways of being intelligent, you know, other than uh, uh, to pass for a human. But but let's 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 broaden it. You know, let's say that you pass the Turing test. You know, if you can pass for uh, uh, you know any kind of being that a you know a person could converse with after you know learning the appropriate language, right? Is is doing something something of that kind with some kind of empirical conversational behavior. Is that a prerequisite for intel? You know, is that a necessary condition for for intelligence or consciousness? You know, uh, uh, I don't know. You know, and is that a sufficient condition? I mean, it seems easy to 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 invent what what you know what look like counterexamples. You know, what if we just created a gigantic lookup table that you know cached you know every, the answer to every possible question that someone could ask? Well, you know, uh, um, by just just uh, by definition, that could pass the Turing test, but it, it, you know, to most people's intuitions, it seems clear that it wouldn't be intelligent, right? Then, then one could ask, well, you know, is it relevant that, you know, such a lookup table probably would not even fit uh, in our universe? You know, it couldn't, it could never actually be constructed. Maybe, you know, if you wanted to build a machine that passed the Turing test and you wanted it to actually fit you know, in our universe, in a box of a reasonable size, then it would have to have a lot of compression of information, right? And maybe that compression is somehow important to what we mean by intelligence. Well, so that, you know, that's another speculation that people talk about. But I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the claim that I would defend is that, um, you know, thinking about, you know, the questions of, of what we can actually build or not sort of, you know, sort of transforms uh, you know, the discussion of the older question. Right? I mean, so, this, yeah. touch, this touches upon the um, considerations uh, about computational complexity. And you actually yes. wrote an article called Why Philosophers Should Care About Computational Complexity. Yes. Um, so coming back to the example of the lookup table, um, in that article, you also criticized another famous attack uh, on, uh, on the Turing test as a satisfactory test for intelligence thinking consciousness or whatever. I mean, that of the John Searle's Chinese room argument. Can you please tell me your, thought, uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so, okay, so, so the, the, the Chinese room, I mean, I mean, you know, the, there, there are all kinds of details in the, in the uh, 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 thought experiment that I think are not really important to the point, you know, I mean, to me, you know, you know okay, the, you know, the, the idea is, well, if, if someone you know, just memorize, you know, a rule book, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that told them how to have a Chinese conversation. And then, you know, they, they, you know, they did that just by passing slips of paper back and forth, uh, that, um, you know, it seems manifestly obvious that they would still not understand Chinese, even though they would pass the Chinese version of the Turing test. Um, you know, and, and the response to that is kind of completely obvious. Well, you know, the person is not even relevant to the question, right? The person is just one little cog in the system. And what we should really be talking about is the system that is passing around, you know, that is moving these slips of paper around, right? In which the person could, you know, easily be replaced by, by, by some, you know, a, a paper moving robot, right? The question is, is that system conscious? You know, uh, uh, does, does that system understand Chinese? And, you know, and then, and then Searle just makes this appeal to incredulity. He says, well, just look at it. It's obviously not, right? And, um, you know, he's, he's considered, a, you know, a very great philosopher. Uh, and nevertheless, you know, it seems to me that the, you know, the reply is equally obvious here that, uh, well, well, you, um, you know, a, a, a look at a brain, right? Well, you know, a brain is, uh, you know, a hundred billion neurons. They're, you know, uh, connected by uh, by synapses. You know, they, uh, uh, um, you know, by, by 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 axons. You know, they, you know, they pass messages to each other, right? You know, is this really fundamentally different from a gigantic machine passing around the slips of paper? And if extraterrestrials visited, couldn't they be equally incredulous? That this that this neuron and axon machine, you know, passing around electrical signals, could could understand anything as we are that you know this room passing slips of paper around could understand Chinese, right? And at that point, 
you know, Searle does something, you know, quite incredible, right? He says, well, the brain is conscious because of its biological causal power. Right, yeah. Right, right? so he basically just, you know, he, he, he gives a restatement of the question and he treats it as though it were an answer, right? And, you know, so to me, that's just not, it's just not moving the discussion forward, right? I mean, it might be true, but it, it's obvious that the question is, well, well then, what are what 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 do these biological causal powers consist of, right? What or what is the principal criterion by which you judge that a brain is conscious, and a big you know machine passing slips of paper around is not conscious? Since your article is called "Why Philosophers Should Care About Computational Complexity," I mean the artificial intelligence uh, uh, segment was covered briefly mm -hmm. now. But what other areas should be? Uh, what other areas do you target in your paper? Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, well, okay, I mean, maybe just as a brief advertisement for, you know, yeah. uh, people who are interested to go and read the article. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I do talk about uh, some things that are of, like, very classical philosophical interest. Uh, you know, I talk about uh, the problem of induction, right, uh, 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 where, you know, I think that uh, the theory of um, uh, computational learning, of, of, of machine learning, has has really given us new insights about you know the problem of induction. It's not that it solved it, but you know in 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 uh, in many settings one can actually justify Occam's razor, right? One can justify you know what if I find a short you know a a a a, a simple or a succinct hypothesis that you know does well at explaining my past data. Uh, why why would I expect it to do well at at, at predicting future data, right? In what circumstances would I expect my hypothesis to generalize? What notions of simplicity are actually the relevant notions, right? And so then, uh, you know, you get, um, you know, actually the mathematical concepts, like uh, what's called the VC dimension, uh, 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 you know, which is a way of sort of measuring the complexity or the simplicity of a class of hypotheses. Right. So, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, you know, and, and so you can actually give sort of technical solutions, you know, I'll, I'll put that in scare quotes, but technical solutions to the problem of induction. Right. Now, you know, the reason for the scare quotes is that for any proposed solution, you know, a philosopher could then push the, the question back to asking, well, what about the assumptions that you, you know, made in your mathematical model? Right. Why are those assumptions justified? Okay, well, you know, of course you can push the question back, right? But this yeah. is just like in any kind of science, right? Like if physicists tell us that the universe started with a Big Bang, you can ask, well, then where did the Big Bang come from, right? You can always ask for a deeper level of explanation, but the point is, you know, in, in just saying that the space that we see around us emerged from a Big Bang, you've said something, you know, you've made progress, you've explained something. And I think that it's very similar with um, with with computational learning theory. Uh, so um, you know, another example that I talk about in the, in the article is uh, um, um, what it means to know something. Um, you know, so there there are there are uh, uh, certain things that like people people might know. Um, uh, um, you know, if you know if if asked about them in one way, but not if asked about them in a different way. Uh, like, like, like if I ask you for uh, uh, what was what was the, the the example that I gave, like the uh, uh, the prime factors of uh, fifteen hundred and ninety one. Okay, uh, right, you know, and and okay, that that that's not such an you know easy question to answer. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, I mean, you know, with with a computer with a calculator, you can answer it. But then if I tell you, well, look, thirty seven and forty three, right, and thirty seven times forty three is going to be 40 squared minus three squared, then you right. say, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> right, so, so you know, and, 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 and these are distinctions that of course we care about enormously in theoretical computer science. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and so I think that, you know, uh, uh, you know, the notions of, you know, computable, computable in polynomial time, you know, can actually help uh, uh, somewhat with, with this discussion of, uh, you know, uh, um, 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 what, um, what does it mean to say that an agent knows something? Uh, how do we avoid sort of the problem of logical omniscience, right? Like, 
like you know you might want to make the simplifying assumption that if an agent knows some things then it knows all of the logical consequences of those things also but then yeah that leads to absurdities right it's it's clear that no one in the history of the world has ever come close to satisfying that criterion of knowing all of the logical consequences of their beliefs but you know clearly people can figure out some logical consequences of their beliefs right so where do you draw the divide you know is there any principled way to draw a line i mean you know in some sense computational complexity is the field that is all about that kind of question right um you know i, I gave a, a, a another example like look what does um what 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 is meant if people say the largest known prime number right what is it what does it mean for a prime number to be known right well the you know you could look at this um a uh, great internet Mersenne prime search, you know, and, and look at whatever is the largest prime that it's currently found and say that that is the largest prime. But what if I simply said, well, no, I, I, I know a larger prime. Uh, the one that I know is the next prime after that one. Right? I, you know, like, like what, what, in, in, in what sense do I not know it? I've just mathematically specified it. I've told you how to generate it with a computer you could get whatever digits of it you wanted, you know, from the description that I gave you, just like you could from the description of the earlier prime that the um, great internet Mersenne prime search will give you, right? Um, but, you know, on, on the other hand, I haven't given you a procedure that I could prove would halt in a polynomial amount of time. Okay, so maybe that's relevant. You mentioned some terms that I would like to spell out further, like polynomial sure. time and uh, yeah. those sort of terms. So I yeah, guess sure. for some people, we should explain what computational complexity really is. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, computational complexity basically is the study of the inherent resources that are needed to solve problems. Uh, by resources, uh, we typically mean things like how much time, you know, how many elementary steps of computation do you need? How much memory, how many bits of memory uh, would you need to store at, at intermediate points? Uh, 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 we, we might also care about other things like um, uh, uh, do, does the use of randomness help you solve the problem uh, faster? Does the use of a quantum computer help you solve it faster? Uh, do the use of many parallel processors help you solve it faster? Okay, so, um, and, and, and with all of these questions, uh, 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 what's one thing that's very important is that we care ultimately about the scaling behavior of, of, uh, of our uh, uh, programs or our, our algorithms to solve these problems. Okay, so we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're not typically interested in does this take 20 seconds to solve or 10 seconds to solve, you know, with, uh, with the latest, you know, you know, uh, uh, Intel chip with, you know, 16 cores or how, however many, right? I mean, you know, those are important questions also, but those are questions for, you know, computer engineers, right? And it's clear that those questions are incredibly contingent on technology, right? On, on tech, not only on technology, but on how exactly how clever someone was in optimizing their program, Right, it depends on all sorts of low-level details that are, you know, important if you want to actually solve something in practice, but that are clearly, you know, not sort of the subject matter of philosophy, right? You know, they're not, you know, you could say a fundamental interest, and, you know, and they're not the subject matter of theoretical computer science either. Okay, theoretical computer science studies questions like, um, um, you know, uh, is it inherent to this problem? that as I try to solve larger and larger examples of this problem, uh, the amount of time that my program ne needs to do that will scale exponentially with the size of the example. Okay, uh, you know, and, and if, if uh, uh, the scaling is exponential, then we would typically, you know, call that inefficient. Okay, because, you know, well, you know, I mean, I mean you know, now in, in, in these days when the coronavirus is ravaging the world, hopefully I don't have to, you know, impress upon anyone the nature of exponential growth, right? But, uh, uh, you know, it will quickly overwhelm much more reasonable growth rates, right? And, and uh, uh, so, you know, if I had a, an algorithm that took two to the n time, n being the, uh, the size of my uh, input, well, then if n is only a thousand, then that would already take longer than the age of the, 
uh, of the universe. Okay, so um, uh, what we what we like um, much more are uh, algorithms that have uh, polynomial growth. Okay, or, or you know where that, that use an amount of time that grow only as a polynomial function of the size of the input. So in other words, uh, for for example, proportional to n or proportional to at least to n squared or n cubed or something like that. Okay, and you know these are the problems that in our first sort of rough approximation uh, we consider to be the efficiently solvable problem. Do you have an example? Now, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, if I ask you to add two numbers, right, this can be, you know, if the, if the two numbers have n digits each, then this can be done in time that scales only linearly with n, right? If the numbers are twice as long, it takes only uh, twice as long to add them, okay? Multiplying two numbers. If you use the algorithm that we all learn in grade school, then the complexity of multiplication is quadratic, right? To multiply two n digit numbers, will take time that scales like n squared, because you have to multiply each digit of the first number against each, each digit of the second, you know, and then also do, do the carries and so forth. Uh, now, it turns out that there are more sophisticated ways to multiply numbers that are known that start winning when you get to really large numbers. And, you know, the, the most efficient that are known are actually use the amount of time that's very, very close to n times log n. Okay, so it's actually very close to linear in n. Okay. Um, uh, most of what we would do with our computers, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis is actually done by polynomial time algorithms. Uh, so, you know, sorting lists, um, you know, uh, the, the algorithms that Zoom is running right now in order for, you know, uh, 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 for you and me to be having this conversation, uh, you know, uh, image processing algorithms, um, um, matching, like if, uh, like, like if I, the, the algorithm that matches in, in the United States, uh, uh, um, 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 medical students to hospitals for their medical residencies. Okay, that, that's a problem that has a clever polynomial time solution that's been known since uh, the 50s or the 60s. Um, uh, searching maps. So, you know, anytime you use Google Maps, you're using some variant of a, a uh, an algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. It's a very famous polynomial time algorithm. Um, um, aligning to DNA sequences, you know, a very important problem in biology, figuring out like what's the minimum number of edits that I have to make to this DNA sequence to make it the same as this other DNA sequence. Uh, that has a famous quadratic time algorithm. Um, testing whether a number is prime or composite. Uh, that uh, was only discovered in 2002 to have a deterministic polynomial time algorithm. Okay, so that was a major breakthrough in, in mathematics, but uh, we now know that it does. Uh, for several decades before that, we had known that the problem of testing whether a number is prime has a fast algorithm uh, using randomness, one that might occasionally uh, uh, have to give up and say that it doesn't know, okay, but that usually works. Um, Okay, now, now uh, if you want to just see the subtlety of this, you know, it might seem like, you know, testing whether a number is prime and factoring it into primes are, you know, are almost the same problem or very similar. But uh, by the light of computational complexity, they are dramatically different, or, or at least they seem to be. Uh, to this day, we do not know of a fast algorithm running on a conventional computer for taking a, a huge number with you know thousands of digits, let's say, and factoring it into its prime factor. Okay, now this is a very very famous problem. You know, it goes back to Euclid. Really, I mean, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. Okay, but uh, it, uh, as, as you probably know, it's acquired even more importance nowadays because we use that and a few related problems basically to to secure the entire internet. Okay, and you know, anytime you uh, Order something, you know, uh, uh, online. Your your credit card number is protected by a cryptographic code that depends on the belief that there is not a fast algorithm for factoring. Um, um, I um, um, interestingly enough, the same algorithm also depends on the knowledge that there is a fast algorithm for primality testing. Okay, for you know, and for 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 generating huge prime numbers. 
and multiplying them together to produce a huge composite number. But in order for the code to be secure, going from that huge composite number back to its prime factors has to be a hard problem, has to be one of these problems that has an exponential type of scaling. But even though we haven't cracked this particular problem, in the meantime, we managed to put a web between various difficult problems such that if you solve any one of them, you sort of crack all of them at once. Uh, those are the so yeah. the so-called NP hard problems. So can you please yeah, tell us yeah. what the NP and NP hard problems yeah, are? Yeah, and then... so yeah. So this, this is a big discussion, right? But I mean, uh, uh, you know, in, in some sense, you know, none of this would be all that interesting if it were just a huge, un, you know, uh, uh, zoo of one problem after the other, you know, where all you could do is say, well, this one we know how to solve quickly, this one we don't know how to solve quickly, this one we do, and so on. But uh, uh, what, what emerged starting in the early 1970s, really, is that there's a gigantic web, you know, just as you said, relating the, all these problems uh, uh, to each other. So they're really organized into, uh, you know, a much more interesting structure and we can't prove nearly everything that we would like to about this structure but you know but you know we know that it's there you know we can prove some some things about it so um so so what we can do is we can organize problems into classes that are solvable with various resources these are complexity classes you know and the complexity classes are one of the, the central objects of study of theoretical computer science okay so the first complexity class uh, is just all of the problems that are solvable by a polynomial time algorithm, right? right. Uh, this class we call P for polynomial time. Okay, technically it's all the decision problems, problems with that, that have yes or no answers. But you know, many many other problems can also be phrased in in that format if you, if you like. Okay, so um, so P is sort of a first. Uh, uh, guess at sort of what is what should we treat as the class of efficiently solvable problems okay but now there, there's uh, an equally important class which is maybe you know um, um, less obvious to think of but it um, consists of all of the problems where there's a polynomial time algorithm to recognize the solution if a solution were to be given to you okay so if we, if we take the example of factoring uh, uh, you know, uh, as I said, we, we do not, no one knows today if factoring is in P, right? That is a great unsolved problem of mathematics. Okay, is there a, an algorithm to factor an n digit number using a number of steps that is polynomial in N? Okay, but one thing that we know for sure is that if someone tells, if someone gives you what they claim are the prime factors of, of your number, then it's very, very easy to tell whether that person is lying or not. Okay, because you just, you, you know, it, it's easy, at least with your computer, to multiply those numbers together, see that they really are factors of the number. And then also, as I mentioned before, we know fast algorithms to check whether those factors are actually prime. Okay, so, uh, so, so the class of all the problems where you could recognize a solution if a solution is given to you, uh, that's called NP. Uh, which stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, and you know the, the 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 terminology is 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 historical. You know, there's a reason why it's called that. But I think that uh, from a modern point of view, the definition that I gave you, the, the checkable problem, is sort of the, the right definition of NP. Okay, and um, so so uh, you know this includes a huge amount of what we would really love to do with our computers. I mean. Um, uh, um, optimization problems, right, that are so central to, you know, finance, to industry, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, you know I, I give you a bunch of constraints, you know, uh, 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 about, about airplanes. I ask you what schedule should we give to this airline that's going to, you know, maximize their, their revenue or whatever, right? So, I mean, I mean these are um, a, a, a combinatorial optimization problems. And, you know, and these can be phrased using NP problems, right? It's not clear that if someone said this is the optimal solution to this problem that you could recognize it, right? You know, how would you know if it's the best solution? But what you can do is you can say, is there a solution that will make, you know, more than 
you know, ten million dollars in a week. Okay, and if there is, then that then it's easy to check that they, those constraints are satisfied. Well, okay, then is there one that will make more than twelve million dollars? Is there one that you know, and you could keep adjusting the number like that. Okay, so so optimization problems. Um, are, are very closely related to these NP problems. But now other examples of NP problems, um, finding a proof of a theorem, okay, uh, of a given length, right? So, you know, the, the famous uh, Entscheidens problem, okay, uh, uh, of, you know, David Hilbert from the year 1900, right, was, uh, you know, given a mathematical statement, you know, is it true or false, okay? Now, uh, uh, you know, after, um, you know everything we 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 learned from 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 Gerdel and so forth. We could revise that question to at least, you know, uh, 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 is there a proof or is there a disproof? You know, from a given system of axioms, let's say from from ZF set theory, you know, from Zermelo Frankel set theory and uh, first order logic or something like that. Um, and you know, and and, and famously, uh, uh, e even that problem is is undecidable. Right, there is no algorithm to solve it running in any amount of time. Okay, but uh, in um, 1956, uh, the same Gödel uh, wrote uh, a now very famous letter to John von Neumann, uh, who was at that time uh, dying in a hospital, and um, he said to, to von Neumann, "Well, well, look, what if we only ask whether there is a proof or disproof uh, of a given statement?" Uh, up to a, a, a you know a, 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 a of a given length or shorter, like let's say you know we we uh, gave an, an unsolved problem in math like Goldbach conjecture or the Riemann hypothesis, and we ask um, is there a proof of of this of this conjecture in a formal language like ZF set theory that consists of at most a billion symbols? Okay, and he said well well if if we ask that then clearly the problem is decidable, right? Because, you know, you could, there's a finite number of possible strings and for each one, you could just check it to see whether it is, is a, constitutes a valid proof or not. So, you know, you would merely have to, you know, um, uh, 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 iterate through all of the, uh, you know, exponential of, of a million different strings, okay? But on the other hand, that would take, far, far long, you know, that, that would take a beyond cosmological amount of time, right? And so he posed the question, uh, uh, well, could there be a, an algorithm to uh, find a proof, you know, wherever it exists, you know, that would only use uh, time that would, uh, like, that would grow linearly or quadratically with the length of the proof, okay? Now, this is the question that today we would immediately recognize as maybe the most famous question in computer science. And this is the question of does P equal NP, right? So I told you these two classes, P, the efficiently solvable problem, NP, the efficiently checkable problem, okay? And NP includes, you know, P includes so much of what our computers actually do today. NP includes so much of what we would like to do with our computers, whether that means, you know, industrial optimization, whether that means, you know, pure mathematics, finding proofs of theorems, uh, problems of AI and machine learning, you know, find a small model that explains this data, find some weights that will make this neural network perform well. These are also NP problems, right? And so if we could solve all of the NP problems, that would clearly be a tremendous boon to artificial intelligence. Um, you know, not clear if it's ne either necessary or sufficient for passing the Turing test, but you know, it would clearly be a huge step forward. Okay, and uh, and amazingly, no one has you know. So you know, we know that p is contained in NP. Every p problem is also an NP problem. If you can, you know, solve a problem yourself, then you know you don't even need someone to hand you the answer, right? You can email. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, the the immediate question you could ask is, well, is p a proper subset of NP, right? is, you know, does NP have problems that are not in P, okay? And, uh, you know, so, so or, or could it be that uh, whenever uh, 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 an answer is efficiently checkable, then that answer is also efficiently findable, right? Now, 
you know, um, most of us in computer science would conjecture that the answer is no. You know, there are going, you know, we, we believe that there will be NP problems that require exponential scaling. Uh, I like to say that if we were physicists rather than computer scientists or mathematicians, we would have just declared that to be a law of nature, you know, maybe given ourselves Nobel Prizes for its discovery, you know, and, and if it were later discovered that T equaled NP, we could just give ourselves more Nobel Prizes, you know. Or the law's overthrow. Okay, but um, okay, but that that's P and NP. That's the P versus NP problem. Now, what what really um, start the, the the discovery that really sort of uh, launched this as as a field and like made people realize the importance of these distinctions was the discovery that many many of the NP problems have a special property of actually encoding the entire class NP, you know, within them. Okay, so, uh, so we say that a, a problem is NP hard if, you know, the ability to solve that problem would let you solve all of the problems in NP, okay? And we say that a problem is NP complete if it's both NP hard and it's in NP, okay? So in other words, the NP complete problems are problems in NP that are sort of maximally hard, that are like among the hardest possible problems in NP. Okay, they're problems where if you could solve any single one of them, then you could solve all of the others as well, and, and P would equal NP. Okay, now from that definition, it's not obvious that there are any NP complete problems. Okay, but what people realized in the early 70s was first of all that there are, and second of all, that actually, um, in some sense, the, the, the vast majority of the hard NP problems that we really care about actually do turn out to be NP complete, right? Uh, so, so what are examples? Uh, um, you know, if I give you a map, right, can you color each country, you know, uh, you know using three colors so that no two uh, neighboring countries are colored the same? Okay, that's called the coloring problem. Uh, you know, if I uh, give you a, a, a graph, like, a, you know, a map, can you, can you visit each uh, city exactly once, uh, um, um, you know, by, by, by traversing the roads that, that are shown? That, that's called the, the Hamiltonian path or Hamiltonian cycle problem. Um, what is the shortest route that connects it? Or, you know, is there a route that connects all the cities of length at most, uh, you know, 2,000? You know, that's called the traveling salesman problem traveling salesperson problem, okay? Uh, um, um, you know, the satisfiability of a sentence in propositional logic, you know, that's maybe, you know, the, the original uh, NP-complete problem, the one that's sort of, uh, uh, the one that was first proven to be NP-complete, okay? So, so it turns out that, you know, if, if you have any, if you make up any problem whatsoever that involves, let's say, a large number of, you know, let's say, let's say a finite number of variables, that's important, so like a finite number of variables that you know you could set in different ways, you know, an exponential growth in the possible ways of setting all of the variables. And now a bunch of constraints that uh, you know constrain what you would like these, these variables to be in overlapping and possibly conflicting ways. Right. So you know, I've just described like you know half of what people want to do in, you know, operations research and computer science and, uh, uh, you know, many parts of, of math, statistics, right? But, but problems of that sort, uh, you know, what we've learned is that they are NP complete unless they have a very good reason not to be NP complete, okay? So there are problems in NP that we think are neither NP nor NP complete. There are problems that we think occupy you know, a, a twilight zone in between the two, you know, that are hard in NP and that are hard, but without being NP hard, okay? And a famous example of that would be the factoring problem, right? Um, um, you know, factoring seems to have very strong theoretical reasons why it should not be NP complete. You know, and incidentally, those reasons are, you know, uh, uh, about, all about special structure in the factoring problem, which is also part of what makes it so useful for cryptography. Okay, so, but you know, but but like like you know you know this 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 uh, you know you know even you know those properties of factoring you know you sort of you wouldn't understand them without the structure in place, right? That's telling you 
that you know there is a web that organizes all of the computational problems you know in terms of reducibility right in terms of you know if i could solve this one then could i also solve that one and, and so forth right uh you know in terms of this uh partially ordered relationship of you know polynomial time reducibility okay and and once you look at pro the universe of computational problems from that lens you see that there's this giant metropolis of easy problems there's this giant metropolis above it of the NP complete problems. We can't prove that they don't actually join into one mega metropolis, but we believe that they don't join. And then there are also some isolated little islands of hardness, uh, uh, such as that uh, we think factoring. But aren't all these classes built on a mathematical theory that is a bit idealized? What I mean by that, you mentioned applications like industrial optimization. But yeah. what I want to ask, since you decide whether an algorithm runs in polynomial time or exponential time, taking into account how it became, how it behaves as you scale up the problem. But mm -hmm. um, if our universe is finite and our, uh, our memory and time resources are finite, it seems to me that sometimes a polynomial time algorithm might behave worse than an exponential time algorithm if the if the input mm -hmm. is uh, is not large enough and moreover it seems it seems to me that because of those memory and time constraints everything would run in constant time same uh, as yes. you speak because yeah. you can yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you yeah. cannot increase the size as much as you want so yeah oh, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. i mean there, there's like there's a running joke in the field right that, like by present beliefs in 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 cosmology uh it looks like you could have no more than 10 to the 122 power bits in the entire observable universe, you know, between, um, you know, the Big Bang and, 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 and the end. So you could say, well, every algorithm, you know, runs in constant time, L of one time, right? It's just that there's a 10 to the 122 inside of the constant. Okay, so, um, you know, I think that, that there, 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 there's a few things to say to that. I mean, um, uh, one is, you know, you know, you know, it's possible to give a true answer to something that's not a useful answer, right? Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, if, if 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 we said, oh, well, you know, the uh, you know the problem is uh, of 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 philosophy is trivial because you know there are, uh, um, you know, uh, we you know we just have to, you know, there's a set of all sentences and there's some subset of them that's the true sentences. And you know those are the ones that are true, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, it, you know, we, we 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 would not have said something useful, right? And um, you know, what we what we would like to know is is you know ultimately sort of which you know for which problems will we be able to solve reasonable sized instances of those problems in reasonable amounts of time, right? Uh, so you know the we, for which problems will we be able to solve you know, the, um, we would be able to solve them for sizes of inputs that arise in real life, you know, in an amount of time, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, is, is sort of commensurate with what's available to human beings on earth, you know, that's not cosmological, okay? And, um, you know, the, you know, uh, um, um, asymptotics is not the only thing that you need in order to answer that question, but it is plainly extremely relevant to that question. Right, and you know, and actually, you know, there have been many, you know, any cases uh, in the history of computer science where people said, okay, you know, it might be that that such and such problem is formally solvable in polynomial time, but the algorithm is just not efficient in practice. Right, it's n to the sixth power, or n to the eighth power, or whatever. But often in those cases, what has happened is that you know, once you know that something is theoretically efficient. Well, then you can work on it more, right? And, you know, in a decade, that n to the six can become n to the four, right? And in another decade, that n to the four can become n to the three, right? And then, you know, and then it starts actually looking practical. Something like that, um, you know, has happened with uh, linear and semi definite programming uh, techniques, um, with, um, um, you know, uh, um, um, uh, um, techniques for uh, um, a markup chain Monte Carlo, like uh, sampling random objects. So yeah, so this is this is this is a real thing that happens. Uh, that uh, once you know, once you know that a problem is is theoretically efficient, 
then uh, you know you can you can work on trying to make it more efficient in practice, right? If if a problem is theoretically inefficient, then definitely there are going to be hard cases of that problem, right? And then you know that also means if you can solve that problem quickly in practice, then almost certainly it is because uh, the input instances that you're being presented with are somehow special, right? They have something special about them that makes them not the hardest possible case of that problem. And then that itself is something that you want to understand better, okay? So, you know, I, I would say that the relation between theoretical and applied computer science, you know, is not that different from the relationship between, you know, theoretical and applied physics. Right, like, like you know, one could say, well, well, you know, it's it's wonderful to learn that that uh, uh, you know, an object in motion remains in motion, right? But in in our our day to day lives, we we find that 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 that's not the case because of friction, you know, because of uh, uh, you know, there are so many complicating factors in real life that uh, uh, you know, you could say obscure the underlying laws of physics, and that are the reason why you know the the actual laws of physics you know took as long to discover as they did right why people were stuck in uh, aristotelian physics for you know two millennia before you know they realized that you no know, there are these more fundamental rules they're just obscured by you know the phenomena that are near the surface of the earth you know i think in in the same way you know there are sort of fundamental rules that govern you know, what kinds of problems are efficient, what kinds of problems are inefficient. And then there are sort of the surface phenomena that, that obscure you know, those fundamentals you know, here on Earth, by which I mean like here at you know, dealing with the small inputs or the special in kinds of inputs that would actually arise in real life. Okay, and if you want to solve problems quickly in real life, then you, know, you need to know sort of all the parts of the story, kind of all the links in the chain. But, you know, I don't think that there's, you know, that, that the people on the practical side, you know, or, you know, I mean, you know, the, you know they're, they're certainly going to understand what it means for something to be NP complete, right? And, you know, uh, 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 you know what, what it means for something to be, you know, as hard as factoring numbers and so forth. And, you know, so, so I mean, you know, the, the, you know, the theory, uh, you know, informs you know, the possibilities of what, you, what you're going to try to do in real life, you know, and if something is too hard, it's going to suggest possibilities for, for how you could work around that. And speaking of physics and the laws of physics, uh, for yes. time considerations, I guess we should get to quantum computing. Absolutely. So, uh, in 1926, or around that time, the world of physics changed and quantum mechanics entered the market. So this is our best theory of the very small. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems as though, uh, despite, it, despite its paradoxical features, no one disputes uh, quantum mechanics. So can you please tell me, it's often told that uh, it matches our experimental uh, predictions with extremely great accuracy. But I've yeah. never seen in those popular accounts an example of where quantum mechanics actually performs so well that you cannot deny it, so you are forced to explain uh, its paradoxical features oh. otherwise. Oh. Well, well, I mean, I mean, the, the example that Richard Feynman uh, loved to use was the uh, the magnetic moment of the electron, where you know you make a prediction based on quantum field theory, you know, where you know, so it's just a calculation that you do, you know, from some constants of physics as as, as inputs, and you make a prediction and you then test it. So I think about you know, and and, and you find that it's accurate to about twelve decimal places, mm -hmm. right? So you know, he, he, he compared it to like predicting the, the distance between New York and San Francisco and being accurate to within the width of a hair, right? So, you know, so it, it's, it's clear that, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, a, 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 a quantum mechanics is not just sort of a, another example of a theory in physics. What it is, is it's sort of, it is a framework in which all of physics is supposed to be formulated. Okay, so, I like to say that you know if if ordinary physical theories are application programs, right? Quantum mechanics is an operating system that all the, the application programs run on. Okay, and uh, it is um, you know it talks about things that are so basic that uh, you know it is you know even just as a thought experiment, it's very hard to figure out 
how quantum mechanics could be only an approximation to anything else, right? It seems like something, it, it feels like something where if it's true at all, that it wants to be exactly true, okay? Now, maybe that's wrong, right? Maybe quantum mechanics will someday be discovered to be only an approximation to something else, but for almost a century now, quantum mechanics has passed every single experimental test that has ever been put, you know, to it, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to the limit to which that test could be conducted, right? There are zero counterexamples to, to quantum mechanics that have ever been found. Um, um, gravity is the one thing that we don't know, people don't know how to treat within the framework of quantum mechanics but sort of the reigning belief of, of most physicists for a very long time has been that even gravity should ultimately be subsumed into the framework of quantum mechanics. So this whole field of quantum uh, computing tries to uh, harness this inner workings of nature in order to build yes. a machine that computes. So can you please spell out yes. what quantum computing exactly is? Yeah, okay, well, I guess first I have to say what quantum mechanics says about the world, right? So right. Uh, I, I like to say that uh, quantum mechanics becomes a lot simpler after you take the physics out of it, you know? So, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in quantum information, let's say, you know, in this field for the last few decades, uh, we've tended to think of quantum mechanics as really just, you know, a certain generalization of the laws of probability themselves, okay? So, uh, it is, um, you know, it, it's not directly about electrons, about photons, about, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, specific uh, objects in nature like that. Those are all just examples of things that quantum mechanics can be applied to, okay? But what, what quantum mechanics is really about is about how do you calculate the probability that something is going to happen, okay? So, um, so, so, I mean, the first, you know, a famous thing that quantum mechanics says, you know, to begin with, that most people have heard, is that, you know, a, a nature has randomness in it at some very fundamental level, right? That, for example, you know, uh, if I have a radioactive atom, I can't predict exactly the time that it will decay at. Even if I know everything there is to be known about that atom, I can only tell you its half-life. I can only give you a probability distribution over, you know, so if we had a large population of atoms, then I could predict almost exactly what, fra what fraction of them will have decayed by a given time, but I can't tell you specifically which atom will have decayed and which one will. Right now, this was something that famously troubled Einstein, and he talked about how God, you know, can't play dice and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the truth is that if that was all there was to it, it would not be nearly so troubling. Okay? So, you know, you could make up like 20 theories before breakfast where, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, um, um, let's say, let's say the uh, uh, atoms would just have some tiny little tags on them that were, you know, unobservable by present day science, but, you know, they just checked their tags and they said, all right, if your tag says this, then decay now and uh, otherwise uh, wait longer, right? Uh, no, but the, uh, the, the, interesting part, the revolutionary part, is that the rules for how you calculate probabilities are completely different from what anyone had thought they were, okay? So, um, you know, so, so uh, uh, you know, the famous illustration of this is the double slit experiment, right, where you can take a photon, you set, you know, let's say shoot photons one at a time at a screen uh, with two slits in it, and then see where these photons would end up on a second screen. And, you know, you find that there are certain places where the photon sort of never wants to appear, where it almost never appears. And yet, if I close off one of the slits, then the photon can appear. In those places. Okay, so by decreasing the number of paths that the photon can take to get somewhere, I can increase the chance that it gets to that place. Okay, so, uh, you know, now, now this is not like, this, you know, you know, we could not explain this by any sort of complicated technical, uh, 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 um, you know, dynamics of how the photon is moving around, right? Because whatever the dynamics were, you might say, if they're anything like what we understand, well then just, you know, increasing the number, the number of paths it can take 
you know, can only increase the probability that it makes it to the destination, right? It can't decrease the probability, okay? But, um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, basically physicists, you know, found just dozens of phenomena like that that they couldn't explain. And, you know, if, if, if I were teaching a physics course, I would have to walk you through all of those phenomena before finally telling you the truth. I'm just going to skip to the truth. Okay, uh, or you know what what people ultimately realized was going on, and this is that um, you have to uh, to each possible way that a system could evolve, you have to give it not just a probability, which is a number uh, you know between zero and one, you have to give it a different number called an amplitude. Okay, amplitudes can be positive or negative, um, you know, and and in fact they can even be complex numbers. Right, so you would never talk about you know a negative 30% chance of, of of rain that would make no sense, but you can absolutely have you know a minus three tenths amplitude for a photon to go through such and such a slit. Okay, and now the rule is well, if I first of all if I you know if I want to know the total amplitude for something to happen, then I have to add up the amplitudes for all of the ways that it could possibly happen. Okay. And if something could happen one way with a positive amplitude, but another way with a negative amplitude, then those two contributions can, as we say, interfere destructively and cancel each other out. So that the total amplitude would be zero, and then that event would never happen at all. Okay? So, you know, if you want to know the probability for something to happen, uh, you, you, the rule is that you have to take the squared absolute value of its amplitude. Okay, and that does give you a number from zero to one. So, uh, so the bottom line is that if uh, uh, um, you know increasing the number of ways for a thing to happen actually can decrease uh, the probability for it to happen because it can decrease its amplitude. Amplitudes are different from probabilities. They can interfere destructively and they can cancel each other out. Okay, so. Uh, now, a quantum computer is basically just a device that would uh, try to exploit this phenomenon of interference, you know, but on a massive scale. Okay, so think of like the double slit experiment, except, you know, instead of uh, uh, with two slits, you know, or with two possible ways that a photon could go, imagine that there were two to the thousand power different ways. Okay, well, now, you know, now you might ask, how could there possibly be that many ways? Well, okay, so this, um, so, you know, another aspect of quantum mechanics, which is called entanglement, okay? But basically, let, let's say that I have a thousand particles, okay? And uh, each particle can be, you know, can store a zero or a one. So it can store one bit of information. Uh, uh, for example, in its spin state, you know, if it's spin up or spin down, okay? So then there are, you know, if we ask how many bits, you know, or how many settings are there for all thousand of these particles? Well, clearly the answer is two to the thousand power, right? Which is, you know, more than the uh, number of atoms in the visible universe. Okay, but now what quantum mechanics unequivocally says, you know, what it has said since 1926 is that to, you know, if these atoms could interact with each other, if these particles can, can interact, um, then they can form what's called an entangled state, which means, you know, there's not a separate, like, you know, there's not, it's not that there's separate quantum mechanical amplitudes for this par particle, for the first particle, for the second one, for the third one, and so on. No, there's just a giant blob of amplitudes for all of the particles together. And specifically, you're going, you know, you may need as many as two to the 1,000 power amplitudes, okay? So for every possible way of uh, 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 of configuring all thousand particles, you know, uh, you need an amplitude. There's an amplitude for all thousand particles to be spin down. There's another, there's an amplitude for all thousand of them to be spin up. There's an amplitude for them to be spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up in a way that would encode a uh, pi or, or, you know, or a line of Shakespeare. Okay. So, uh, uh, so, you know, so, so, so in some sense, quantum mechanics has told us for a century that, you know, nature uh, ha has this vastness to it that we don't directly see, right? That just to keep track of a thousand measly particles, you know, you need more parameters than could be written down in the whole visible universe. 
Okay, the central idea of quantum computing, um, you know, uh, 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 which you know Richard Feynman and David Deutsch and others proposed in the early 80s, is to somehow harness that vastness and make it work for you. Right? I mean, people knew about this sort of exponentiality of amplitudes uh, for a long time. They knew about it mostly as a practical problem, right? That if you are trying to simulate a quantum mechanical system, like, like even just a simple molecule, like the water molecule or something, using a conventional computer, then the time needed for the simulation seems to scale exponentially with the number of particles, right? It seems to not be a problem that is in P, at least as far as we can tell. Okay, now um, it was only um, um, 40 years ago or so that Feynman and Deutsch and a few others had the remarkable idea well, if nature is giving us that computational lemon, then why don't we make it into lemonade, right? So why don't we build computers that themselves would, would exploit this exponentiality of amplitudes? And if we did that, then maybe we could increase the set of problems that we could then solve in polynomial time. But here I have a question. I mean, uh, yeah. in classical information and classical bits are typically physically implemented in uh, electrical circuits. But given that yes. those uh, ensembles of um, qubits are so sensitive and fragile to being observed, how actually can you uh, implement them in a way that is physically possible? No, I, I, I thought you were a philosopher. You're okay. You're, you're asking a practical problem now, but uh, you know, of course, uh, of course, an incredibly important one, and you know, and and uh, and and, um, and 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 maybe you know, even a deep one. I mean, look, when 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 the ideas of, of, of quantum computing, you know, were first really seriously pursued, you know, let's say in the in the early to mid 1990s, right? There were distinguished physicists and computer scientists who said. Uh, this is impossible to build, right? This is always just going to be only a theory that's that's on paper, um, uh, uh, because you know uh, uh, qubits are just too sensitive to being measured, okay? And um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, so one central property of of a qubit is that you know it is it's incredibly fragile, okay? It uh, uh, you know it, it, as soon as you look at it. Uh, you know, then it's no longer in a superposition of a zero and a one state, right? It no longer has an amplitude for being zero and an amplitude of being one. You know, your looking has collapsed it to one or the other with, you know, the appropriate probabilities. You know, I, I hasten to add, you know, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a person who is looking, okay? Any kind of interaction between the qubit and its external environment like, you know, the, the uh, radiation in the room, you know, even the silicon wafer that it's on, you know, but, but any interaction that has the effect of carrying away uh, information about whether that qubit was a zero or a one, by leaking it into the environment, will have the same effect on the qubit as if it were measured, okay? So qubits are different from classical bits and that, you know, they are incredibly fragile in this way. And so some people said, you know, they will always be too fragile to control. You know, quantum computing will always just be an unrealizable dream. Now, there was a huge discovery in the mid 1990s that changed almost everyone's views about this. And this was the discovery of what's called quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance, okay? So basically what was found was that in principle, one can, it is, it is possible to take uh, the state of a qubit, say one qubit, which means, you know, a bit that has an amplitude to be zero and an amplitude to be one, and you could encode it across the state. You could take one logical qubit and encode it across the state, uh, a collective state of many, many physical qubits, like, you know, uh, tens or hundreds or even thousands of physical qubits, but in such a way that, um, you know, if even if a small fraction of those qubits were to leak into the environment, uh, uh, you could still recover the uh, state that you care about from the remaining qubit, okay? You can still recover your logical qubit from the remaining ones. And people then generalized that discovery to what was called the theory of quantum fault tolerance, which basically says even, you know, if you build a quantum computer, uh, you know, it's not necessary to make 
perfect components that are perfectly isolated from their environment. Okay? It is enough to make really good components that are really, really, really well isolated from their environment. And if you can you know, um, you know, uh, get the rate of noise and the rate of interaction with the environment down to below some threshold, then uh, uh, you, know, you can, you can uh, use these quantum error correcting codes to push the effective error rate down towards zero. Okay? So you know, an analogous theory had been developed for classical computing by John von Neumann in the 1950s. And, you know, and then it ended up not really being needed because transistors just became so good, so reliable, so you know, naturally fault tolerant, if you like, that you, know, you didn't need sort of active error correction on top of it, uh, you know, you know, a little bit, like for, you know, disks can fail and so forth. Okay, but, but you know, in, in the quantum case, we think that active error correction actually is going to be needed. But once you have active error correction, then it looks like quantum computing actually is possible. Uh, you know, or you know, at any rate, I think what 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 the what what this theory did is that it sort of shifted the burden onto the skeptic, at least in my opinion. Right? It is now sort of you know their task to explain why this cannot scale. Okay? And you know, okay, if if you look at you know what's happened over the last thirty years or so. You know, we still don't have a scalable, you know, universal, pro fully, you know, programmable quantum computer. But you know, the experiments have come an enormously long way, right? Just this past fall, we saw the first achievement of a milestone that's been called quantum supremacy, right? Uh, uh, which means it's like the first use of a quantum computer. In this case, one with 53 qubits. To do some computation, some you know contrived computation, but that we think would take about two to the 53 power uh, steps to simulate using a classical computer. Okay, uh, the, you know that was by a team at Google. You know that was um, um, you know that was that was a huge milestone for the field. Uh, now now uh, uh, useful quantum error correction has still not been experimentally demonstrated. Okay. But it is no longer being talked about as, oh, it's possible in principle, and you know, but who knows if it'll take 100 years. Useful quantum error correction is something that you know, the group at Google and, and uh, groups at IBM and, and, and other groups around the world are racing to demonstrate within the next few years. Okay? So uh, uh, as I said, I mean, you know, like, like, look, before the Wright brothers, you know, there were hundreds of years when people talked about heavier than air flying machines and a lot of people said, you know, it would never be done, right? And, you know, but, but I think the people who say, who say that, you know, it's, you know, a technology is possible, they're not always, you know, the starry-eyed, you know, idealists. Sometimes they're just scientific conservatives, right? I mean, I think of myself as a scientific conservative. I say, you know, quantum, you know, uh, let's just believe quantum mechanics. Let's take it seriously, you know, and if we take it seriously, then it's very, very hard to understand why, you know, given the theory of quantum fault tolerance, it's very hard to understand why a, um, a scalable quantum computer should not ultimately be possible. And to end up on a more philosophical question, assume we are yeah. not skeptics about quantum computers and we manage to yeah. build one and actually manage to implement one of the algorithms that everyone talks mm -hmm. about, namely Shor's mm -hmm. algorithm for factorization. You mentioned uh -huh. in your famous essay that uh, David Deutsch, one of the people that you mentioned, said that if you are able to actually go through with this computation, then this would be evidence that uh, for the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So yeah, so that, 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 I mean, I mean, that speculation was actually, or that, that argument was, 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 what, was what led Deutsch to the idea of quantum computation in the first place, right? He was, you know, he's, he's not interested in practical problems about building faster computers, right? He was interested in, you know, uh, is, is there any empirical test of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics? Right. So the many worlds interpretation is simply, you know, the, the view of quantum mechanics that says that uh, uh, 
you know, when I make a measurement of a, on a quantum system, what's really going on is that that's just not yet another example of quantum entanglement. Okay, that I become entangled with this, you know, the state of my body, of my brain, and so forth, becomes entangled with the system that I'm measuring. In which case, you know, quantum mechanics would say, uh, you know, the the you know the entire you know universe you know, is now, uh, can now be written as a superposition of, with two different states, you know, and in one state with some amplitude, I perceive one outcome of the measurement. And in the other state, I perceive the other outcome of the measurement. But, um, you know, quantum mechanics is a linear theory where, you know, these two uh, branches will just now stay around forever and uh, continue forever. There's there's nothing that's going to kill one of them off. And so then a many worlder would say that at that point, there's just two parallel versions of me. And, you know, I only, you know, each version perceives itself as being the only one, you know, they can't communicate with each other, but they they both exist. You know, a many, a many worlder would say that there is no ground for saying that whichever one we happen to be is the only one. And that the branch that got the other measurement outcome is, is, is less real uh, 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 than ours is. Okay, so um, you know that you know that was the, the, this interpretation of quantum mechanics was proposed by Hugh Everett in 1957. Uh, it's only started to get really seriously discussed in the 1970s. Um, um, Today, I would, say, I would say it is one of the leading interpretations of quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, it, it sounds wild to people, but, you know, the, the point to understand about it is that in some sense, you know, from, from a certain point of view, it's the most conservative interpretation of quantum mechanics, right? It's the one that sort of tries the hardest not to add any new ingredient, like, you know, measurements or collapse, or, you know, it, it tries to add, not add a sort of new primitive into the the basic ontology of the world, you know, the price that you pay for that is, well, now, you know, you, you have to accept that all these parallel versions of you are real. Uh, but, um, um, you know, I, I mean, for a long time, you know, this was treated as, as sort of obviously a metaphysical question, right? This is obviously sort of outside the scope of anything that physics or, you know, empirical science can really uh, sink its teeth into. Uh, the reason being that, you know, by construction, this many worlds interpretation, you know, makes exactly the same predictions for any experiment that anyone could imagine doing as just, you know, the, the, the older, you know, version of quantum mechanics, that the one that just says, well, when, when, you know, when you look, then the quantum state collapses, right? You know, the many worlds version says, well, you know, it looks to you exactly as if it's collapsed. Right, and so so how could we, how even in principle, how could you ever tell the difference? Uh, so you know the thought that Deutsch had was, well, you know, what if we ourselves could you know exist in quantum superposition states, right? So what if someone could do a quantum mechanical interference experiment, but you know on the different states of your brain, you know, or like if they could do a double slit experiment, but where you know with instead of a photon passing through the slits in the superposition, uh, it would be you, <laughs> As, you know, uh, right? And, and, you know, in a situation like that, it seems evident that, you know, you would need to talk about, you know, a superposition of different versions of you having a superposition of different experiences, you know, even just to describe what it is that you are experiencing, right? You know, if, if indeed you're experiencing anything in a, in a scenario like that, right? And so, uh, now, now uh, it, it seems likely that that kind of experiment could never actually be done with a biological human brain, okay? Because you know the brain, by its nature, is just a very you know hot, wet, noisy system, right? It, it you know it loses quantum coherence almost instantly, right? Just you know left and right, okay? But he said, well, first of all, you know, what if we could upload our brains to computers? Okay, so this is you know you know it's just step one in the thought experiment, you know, what if we could build computer programs that were conscious, you know, possibly just by emulating our brains. And now what if we could load those programs onto quantum computers? And then it seems like plainly we could set up a situation where we would have 
a superposition, you know, uh, over two different mental states. And then, you know, uh, uh, you could say that, you know, the, the sort of the, the, you know, the rubber would meet the road in, in a new way for these debates about the many worlds interpretation, because, you know, if we believed that, that being was conscious at all, then we would have to believe that, you know, now we could do an experiment to confirm that, yes, it is now in a superposition over different conscious states. Uh, you know, exactly like the many worlds interpretation says. Um, you know, now, you know, this is stuff that people still argue about. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, Deutsch actually had a famous passage in a book that he wrote in 1997, uh, The Fabric of Reality, uh, where he says, look, uh, uh, you know, he's talking about Shor's algorithm, right? So uh, we didn't even mention this, but the most, maybe the most famous discovery uh, in quantum algorithms was that if you build a quantum computer, then that actually could solve the factoring problem in polynomial time, a problem that we talked about before, right? Uh, uh, so even, you know, even though we don't know whether factoring is in P, um, factor, it turns out that factoring is in BQP, which, which stands for bounded error quantum polynomial time, and which is the quantum generalization of the class P, okay? And that was uh, discovered by Peter Shore in 1994. Uh, uh, and, you know, and, and that was, I would say, really the discovery that uh, uh, sort of started quantum computing as a serious research field, as opposed to just something that you know, a few oddballs uh, thought about. And, um, you know, and, and it means, among other things, that if, if and when a practical, you know, a truly scalable quantum computer is built, then uh, almost all of the encryption that we currently use to protect the internet uh, would be broken. Okay, so you know, so that, that's a, an enormous practical implication that a quantum computer would have, even just for solving a purely classical problem, right? A problem that uh, uh, a priori had nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Okay, so uh, you know, we we I should I should add that we don't know that quantum com if quantum computers would provide nearly as great an advantage for the NP complete problem. Uh, uh, we think that they would give a modest advantage, a polynomial advantage for the NP complete problem, but not an exponential advantage. Okay, that, you know, like so much else in, the, in this field, that, that, that hasn't been proven, but that, that's, what, that's what we believe is true. Um, but factoring, you really would get an exponential advantage from a quantum computer over the best known classical algorithm. Okay, so now Deutsch, you know, writing three years after Shor's algorithm had been discovered. Um, in his book, he famously said, to anyone who clings to a single universe worldview, uh, I issue the following challenge, uh, explain how Shor's algorithm works, right? So like, if, if there are not all of these parallel universes, then where is the computation getting done? You know, where is the work to factor this number getting, getting invested? Uh, you know, now, you know, I, 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 so, so, you know, this is, this is to me is like a perfect example, just to wrap all the way back to the beginning of our conversation of how, uh, um, you know, uh, advances in science can sometimes, you know, without solving a philosophical question, they can sort of change the terms of the question in some sense, right? They can let us see the question in a completely different light. Uh, uh, you know, still maybe without answering it, right? There were still ways that, you know, uh, a believer in only one universe, you know, could say, well, look, you know, in order for two things to count as different universes, you know, that, you know, even by the lights of the many worlds interpretation, right, they have to be out of causal contact with each other, right? They have to be, you know, sort of decohered from each other, you know, not interfering with each other, right? But in Shor's algorithm, all these different states are all interfering with each other, right? They're all in one big kind of quantum mechanical blob. You know, in fact, if they're not all interfering with each other, then the algorithm is not going to work, right? So then, you know, such a person might say, well, from the very fact that the algorithm works, you know, or that, that the quantum computer works, we see that, you know, that the universe is never sort of uh, bubbled off to form their own distinct identities, right? And they were all just, you know, they all just recombined into our one universe. Okay, so I think that, you know, my, my prediction is that if and when useful quantum computers get built, 
I mean, you know, the many worlds interpretation might actually gain in popularity, you know, as it has been gaining in popularity uh, anyway, you know, according to uh, opinion polls that I've seen. Okay, uh, you know, it might force people to reckon with it in a, you know, with the enormity of what quantum mechanics really says in a way that, you know, they hadn't before. At the very least, it will show people that quantum mechanics actually is true at the scale of a quantum computer, right? Where, you know, it's never been directly tested in that setting. And, you know, because, you know, I think one of the main reasons for trying to build a quantum computer is, you know, forget about all the applications just to see that quantum mechanics itself actually works, you know, at, at, at the scale of something like Shor's algorithm. Okay, so it will, it will test all of, it will confirm all of that. But after all the dust settles, I would imagine that people will still be arguing about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. They'll still be arguing about philosophy and about what does it all mean, even in a world that has quantum computers. It's just that the terms of the debate, you know, might might be somewhat different from from from, from what they were in the previous world. Professor Aronson, thank you for your time. This was great fun. Of course, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. All Have right. A good day. Bye. Thanks. You too. Okay.